Um, David, we, this conference here is to promote expository preaching, uh, and you've been talking to us about having the Word of God in the driver's seat uh, in church and ministry. Um, but there must be more to it than uh, to, you know, to faithful teaching, than studying God's Word and uh, preaching it out again. Because Jesus himself, in John 5, he scolds, doesn't he, the, uh, the uh, Jews and said, you, you, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you find eternal life, uh, but there's something missing. Uh, can you actually study and preach the Bible in a way that Jesus wouldn't be happy with? Hmm. <laughs> yes, because he says, but you don't come to me. Uh, you study the scriptures, but you don't come to me because he's the center of the scriptures and the purpose of the scriptures is not just to fill our minds with God's revealed truth, but to change our lives and to direct our wills so that we want to follow in his footsteps, believe in him, trust in him and obey him. So it would be possible to do academic study. In fact, many people do on the Bible as ancient literature or as theological documents. But the whole purpose of the Bible is to transform our lives and to bring us into the likeness of Christ. The other thing I think that's important is that every text of the Bible is set in a context. And one of the things we've been trying to do together um, this week is to uh, set Zechariah in his own context and in the whole Bible context. And it's really important to do that because as you come to study any part of the Bible, you bring with you your own framework of what you've already learned from the Bible, uh, all that you've experienced of God in your life. All of us have a framework which we bring to the Bible. And uh, we need to make sure that in our framework um, there is a, a, an overview of the whole Bible because that is what will help us to interpret this passage properly. So no book of the Bible, no part of a book ever just fell out of heaven like that. Boom, there's a bit of Zechariah on the ground. Uh, it's not like that. It's set in a book and the book's in a set of books that we call the Old Testament prophets. And we must interpret the text in the context. So I think that's another way in which we could study the Bible inappropriately if we don't have a, a whole Bible theology which will build up gradually. You can't, you can't just get it overnight, but you can be building it all the time so that all the parts fit together coherently. Okay. Um, now that's called biblical theology, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about biblical theology? Uh, well, biblical theology says, on the basis of what Jesus himself said, of course, that he is the center of all the scriptures. So Jesus says that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the prophets, and all the writings of the Old Testament, he says this in Luke chapter 24, reflect him, speak about him, point to him. He's the key to the whole scripture. And Jesus is the focal point to which all the Bible is, is pointing. Now, if that is so, then the Bible is one unit. I know it's made up of 66 books, but Genesis to Revelation is one consistent Revelation. It has one mind behind it, the mind of God, one inspirer, the Holy Spirit, many human authors, but one controlling divine revelation. So we believe then that all the parts will fit together. If there is one mind behind the Bible, there won't be contradictions in the Bible. God will uh, be revealing himself in all sorts of different contexts and ways, but it will be coherent, it'll fit together. So biblical theology traces the big picture story from Genesis through to Revelation. And it's really the theology of redemption, of salvation, how God rescues people, how he binds himself to them by his covenant mercy and love. And how all that culminates in Jesus. So all those Old Testament pictures of the Exodus and um, the exile and things like that that we've been talking about this week find their fulfillment in Jesus and will find their ultimate fulfillment in the eternal kingdom. Now, I won't take the whole of the rest of the evening to talk about it, but that's the exciting picture of biblical theology. So it's really important to try and get hold of um, a deeper understanding of that because you'll find it 
illuminates all sorts of things in the Bible that may have been a bit hazy before. Mm, thank you. Now, if we wanted to find out more about biblical theology, are there particular books that we could, that we could there read? There are indeed. In fact, I have one down there which I was going to uh, mention this evening. And, um, yes, that's that. Um, this is the book that really got me started into biblical theology. It's a book called According to Plan. It's by an Australian Bible scholar called Graham Goldsworthy. And it traces the big themes of biblical theology all the way through the Bible. You have to work at it. It's quite a demanding book, but it's very clear, very worthwhile. And uh, if you put some effort into it, it will repay your study energy um, many, many times over. So that's one book I would recommend. Another book which we don't have any copies left of tonight, uh, but which you could order, is a book called God's Big Picture, which is by a British scholar called, a uh, preacher called Vaughan Roberts. And um, that's another really good introduction. A little less heavy than this, a little more accessible and easy in some ways. So if you're just starting out uh, on the Christian life and studying the Bible, I'd go for Vaughan Roberts as your first choice. If you've been a Christian a little while and you want to get more into biblical theology, Goldsworthy is your man. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Thanks. David. Okay. So we come now this evening to our final section of Zechariah, the shortest of the three sections, and we're going to conclude our studies with these last three chapters, 12, 13, and 14. Last night on Zechariah, this was what we were doing. We were looking at those three peaks of fulfillment and significance, which are true of all Old Testament prophets, and which we've been trying to work out from this exciting book this week. It's been a real encouragement to me uh, to have people come up to me each evening and say that they've found things uh, being made more clear through the studies we've had, that they've been excited by what they've heard, that Zechariah's coming alive in new ways. That's been a great joy for me, a great answer to prayer. And I do want to take this uh, opportunity on the last evening to thank you for your support, for your prayers, and for your fellowship. It's been a great treat for us to be with you these few days, and we shall have very, very happy memories of the Clang Valley Bible Conference. So thank you for that, and for all your encouragement given to me. Now, those three peaks, let me remind you what they were. What did it mean to the people of Zechariah's day? First point of significance. How has Jesus' coming fulfilled all of that? What difference does it make that he's now come and that his great work on the cross has been accomplished? And what is yet to be accomplished in the eternal kingdom when he returns in power and glory? That's the fulfillment motif that runs through the prophets. That's part of biblical theology, that the Jesus who was promised in the old came as a baby at Bethlehem, lived and grew and ministered and died and rose and ascended and is glorified, is the Jesus who will return in power and glory. Now, in the second part of the book of Zechariah, and many scholars would divide it at the end of chapter 8, and then say 9 to 14 is the second half. The reason for that is because if you look in your Bibles, at the start of chapter 9 it says an oracle, which really means a sermon or an address, although the literal meaning of the word in Hebrew is a burden, something that is heavy to carry. Chapters 9 to 11 constitute an oracle, and as we start tonight at chapter 12, again we read that it's an oracle, a burden. The first burden, as we saw last night, deals with the first coming of Jesus, riding on, to, on a donkey into Jerusalem, and later being rejected by his people who turn their back on the shepherd king who comes to rescue them. The second burden, chapters 12 to 14, that we look at tonight, deals with what happens up to the second coming of Jesus. So tonight we're on the third peak particularly. We're looking at what is yet to be fulfilled in the glorious purposes of God when Christ comes again. So if the first burden is all about the first coming and the second about the second coming, we're in between the two comings. And therefore what we're looking at tonight concerns the experience of the church 
in the present age until Jesus returns. The New Testament term for that is the last days. We live in the last days. We know that the church has always lived in the last days. When we talk about eschatology, and uh, we were talking about that little book I've tried to write on the Christian hope, people often come up to me and say, do you think we're living in the last days? And the answer is, of course we are. The church has always lived in the last days. Because biblically, the last days are the days between the ascension of Jesus and the return of Jesus. There is nothing more to happen in God's great salvation plan until Christ returns. He's gathering his people all the time. But the last days are the days since Jesus went back until he comes again. So that's what we're dealing with, the last days in these, verse, in these chapters. But what we need to remember is that the pictures that are used and the language that Zechariah has are... Of the, uh, are the things that were available to him in his day and generation. This is Old Testament writing. It's in Old Testament thought forms. And um, what he looked for in the future, he expresses in terms that would make sense to the people of his generation when he first spoke to them. So as we come to this last section of Zechariah, we need to be very careful about the lines that we draw from the Old Testament terminology to the second coming reality. Jerusalem, for example. Jerusalem is for Zechariah, the earthly city, the capital of the nation in which the temple has been rebuilt. Jerusalem for the New Testament fulfillment peak is the city of God coming down from heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, where the dwelling place of God comes to be with man in the eternal kingdom. So if we just think about Jerusalem in terms of the earthly city, we will miss the biblical theological fulfillment motif, which is that Jerusalem is fulfilled in the heavenly city, which is the kingdom of God. Israel. Israel, of course, means the old covenant people of God who were the sons of Abraham. But if we just stop there, we'll miss the New Testament fulfillment motif, which is that under the new covenant, which Jesus made through his blood shed on the cross, the church of God is the Israel of God. Galatians 6.16. The church is the Israel of God. The fulfillment motif takes you from the nation state of Israel in Zechariah's day to the universal church of God, people from every kindred and tribe and nation. Or think of the dynasty of David. Well, there were many kings who followed David, and uh, there was still a, a, a sort of kingship when Jesus came to earth. Herod was a sort of uh, king in, the, in that order, though he was uh, only partly Jewish himself. But if we only just think about the kings of Jerusalem or of Israel, we miss the New Testament fulfillment motif, which says that there is one great son of David, the greater son, the greatest son. And that, of course, is the Lord Jesus, born in the line of David of the tribe of Judah. He is the great fulfillment of the Davidic dynasty. So that when Isaiah says, um, this king is going to come in the line of David and the government will be on his shoulder, he's pointing to the universal rule of Jesus. Now, we must keep those things in mind or we'll go quite badly wrong here if we simply stopped on the first peak because some of the things that are talked about here um, clearly require eternity for their fulfilment. And, what the, uh, and the clue that we are given about that is that many times in these three chapters the phrase, on that day, is used. On that day points to the forward fulfilment when Christ will come again to establish the eternal kingdom. God will defeat all of his people's enemies. His people will be shown to be those who have repented of their sins and put their faith in the Messiah. And within these chapters, there are three great events that occur by which God brings his purposes to fruition, to completion, and opens the way to the eternal kingdom. Let me just tell you what they are, because we're going to, to center on those tonight. They are the piercing of the Lord in chapter 12, verse 10. 
the opening of the fountain in chapter 13 verse 1 and the smiting of the shepherd in chapter 13 verse 7. Those are the three sort of central concepts here in these closing chapters that open up the door to the work of Christ, to the fulfillment of that in the eternal kingdom and to all that God still purposes to do in the return of Jesus. Now, at chapter 12, verse 1 then, we encounter this second oracle, this burden, this time specifically concerning Israel. That's how it begins, chapter 12, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. First point of reference will be to Zechariah's day, the Israel of Zechariah's day, but this is clearly the Israel of God in terms of the fulfillment motif of the church of the future. And as this second burden unfolds, it is overwhelmingly forward-looking. Sixteen times on that day, on that day, it pushes us into the future. And that expression on that day is akin to the expression the day of the Lord, or the last day, or the day of judgment. So it points us forward, beyond Christ's first coming, to his return. And it unveils the events which will precipitate the end of history. At the start of this unit then, 12 to 14, the nations of the world are gathered together against Jerusalem to seek to destroy her from the face of the earth. Uh, You can see that very clearly in these opening verses in chapter 12, especially in verse 3. On that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. That's how it starts. All the nations gathered against God's people. At the end of the unit, chapter 14 and verse 16, if you'll just turn over to that, you read that then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So you've got all the nations attacking Jerusalem. Something happens to them so that there are only some survivors left. But by the end of the unit, the survivors are going up to Jerusalem, not for war, but for worship. To acknowledge that the Lord Almighty is the King of all. So keeping those perspectives in this last section, um, the future is revealed to Zechariah's hearers to encourage them to put their faith in God now, to stimulate them to obey God in the present, because there is going to be a great fulfillment ahead in the coming of the Messiah, especially in his death and resurrection, and that will open the way to the end of history and the coming of the eternal kingdom in the new creation of complete fulfillment and satisfaction. So that's the biblical theological progress that we've got in these chapters and I want us to try and keep that perspective in view. They don't all fit into all of the verses but the material ranges through these themes and uh, we are so much better able to understand it than Zechariah's original hearers could because we can see it all through what Jesus has done. Well now let's pick up this first theme then. Uh, God comes to reveal himself and his purposes to his people and it's quite mind-blowing in its complexity and scope. I love that first verse that says the Lord who is speaking this word through Zechariah is the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth and who forms the spirit of man within him. That is a very comprehensive description of God, isn't it? It reminds us at the very beginning of this unit unit, that God is the architect of the whole universe, that he continually forms and enables the spirit of men and women made in his image, that he made the world and he made its inhabitants, and that he governs it all according to his sovereign power. That is the given at the beginning of of chapter 12. If you want it again from the Bible, what about Psalm 21, uh, sorry, 24 verse 1? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it, the world and all who dwell in. This living, eternal, creative, controlling God 
is the one who is speaking these words about the future of planet Earth. So they're authoritative words, they are powerful words, they are words of truth, they are words that will be fulfilled. And they give to us the assurance that the God who promises is the God who will perform. Now I want to just stop there for a moment because, you see, we find that really difficult in our culture, don't we? Because we're so used to empty promises. We're so used to people saying they'll do things and they don't. We do it ourselves. We let people down very frequently. Or we're so used to putting on a good show and a good performance and talking things up. But underneath, there's not very much reality. Uh, one of the things we have to learn is that saying something is so doesn't make it so. Uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes tempting to be cynical, isn't it? Uh, you hear politicians talking everything up and saying everything's wonderful, and you know it isn't. But they're trying to get you to be enthusiastic and not to look at the problems. And so we tend to think that people's words are not very valuable. And then we think, well, perhaps God's word's like that. Perhaps he's talking it all up. Perhaps it's not going to happen because saying it is so doesn't make it so. Uh, some of you will know a little bit about the British royal family. You will know that there is a gentleman called the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, and another Prince Andrew called the Duke of York. Those are titles that members of the royal family have had from generation to generation. And this little illustration is not about those two gentlemen, but about two boys who held the titles a couple of generations back. The story is told how they escaped from the royal palace in London and they decided that they would play football in the royal park, which of course was forbidden because you can't enjoy yourself in royal parks. So um, uh, there was no football, no ball games, notices, but these two escapees, who were the Prince of Wales and the Duke of York in their generation, got out and they found a third little boy and they were having a great game of football until the policeman came along. The policeman came along and said, do you not see that notice? No ball games here. I'm going to have to report you to your parents and they will teach you a lesson. <laughs> so he gets out his notebook and he says to the first little boy, this was of course in the days before television and many pictures of royal children, and what is your name? Oh please sir, the Prince of Wales. So he writes the Prince of Wales in his notebook and where do you live? I live in Buckingham Palace. Oh, right, Buckingham Palace. And what is your name, Sonny? Please, sir, the Duke of York. So he writes in his book, the Duke of York, and you live in Buckingham Palace too? Yes, yes, I live in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and the third little boy who they just picked up this game of football with looks at them with his mouth wide open and he thinks, well, if they can get away with it, I can get away with it too. <laughs> so the policeman turns to him and says, yes, Sonny, and what is your name? Please, sir, the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> But saying so doesn't make it so, see? You can say all sorts of things. Now, when we're talking about what God says, we are dealing with absolute truth. And we must take ourselves to task here and not start to think that somehow the Lord's words are anything other than totally trustworthy. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So he says that he is going to bless his people and he's going to give them two great blessings, victory over their enemies and the gift of the repentant heart that will bring them back into a right relationship with him. First gift is in verses 1 to 9, the second in verses 10 to 13. Now, once again, let's go back to the start of the unit. Jerusalem is under attack from all the nations. When did that actually happen historically? Answer, it didn't. There has never been a time from Zechariah's time onward when all the nations were gathered against Jerusalem. Clearly, many nations have fought over Jerusalem. Many armies have marched through the land of Israel. And still today, there's a huge amount of potential conflict there. But there has never been yet all the nations gathered together against Israel. That leads me to think that this may not be so much a picture of the earthly city of Jerusalem, but more a picture of the community of God's people after the coming of Jesus 
against which the nations of the world have very often been opposed. Whether you take it as Jerusalem in Zechariah's day, a great promise of defence, or whether you take it as a broader promise of defence for the people of God as the church faces hostility in the world, nevertheless what God says is, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. In other words, when God purposes to defend his people, no human power can overcome him. He says that uh, he will uh, strike the armies that are opposing his people with panic and madness, verse 4, that he will watch over his people and that their strength will be entirely due to his presence. In fact, he says in verse 6 that he will make them like a consuming fire because to have the Lord Almighty as your God is always to have potential access to his limitless power. So he declares to his people as they are attacked and beleaguered at any time in history because this is the character of God in covenant relationship to his people that the Lord will save, verse 7, that the Lord will shield, verse 8, and that the Lord will set out to destroy all those who attack his people, verse 9. So that is the big picture here. This constitutes a new affirmation of the promises God made to David and to Jerusalem. And as a result, the royal house of David and the royal city of David assume a new splendor and a dignity and an awesome identity which is akin to the identity of God himself. I think that's the explanation of that verse 8 which says, the feeblest among them, that is among the dwellers in God's city, will be like David, and the house of David, the royal household of the city, will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. Now again, the Davidic monarchy was not restored until Jesus came. So Jesus is the Davidic figure, and the church is the inheritor of these promises, that the Lord will save his people, that the Lord will shield them, and ultimately destroy their enemies. So I want us to see that this picture of Jerusalem makes most sense if we take it along the biblical theological fulfillment motif to see that it's a picture of the church and that we're looking at God's defense of his people in every day, in every generation throughout the history of the church against the ongoing hostility which may come from all sorts of different sources by which the church is facing um, attacks all its uh, in, in every aspect of its life now God promises then the deliverance of his people we don't need to fear for the future of the church Jesus said I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it he will defend his city and if you're a Christian tonight then you're a member of that eternal city John Newton says in his great hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, Saviour, since of Zion City I through grace a member am, let the world deride all pity. I will glory in your name. Fading is the world's best pleasure, all its boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasure, only Zion's children know. That's not talking about Old Testament Jerusalem that's talking about being a member of Christ the body of Christ the living church of Christ what a privilege we've got we're members of Zion City and God is committed to defending that city and to making it an immovable rock and tonight you can think back just in the history of the last hundred years let alone centuries before that of many people who are going to destroy the church stamp out the Bible going to exterminate the remembrance of Christ from the earth. And where are they tonight? Dust and ashes. And where is the church tonight? More numerous than it has ever been in terms of the percentage of people in the world population who are Christians. And just as we uh, rejoice in the fact that the gospel is spreading all over the world, yes, the world population is expanding at a huge rate, but the percentage of Christians is higher now than it's ever been. Because God is building his church. So have confidence in that. You haven't joined some little outfit that's going to collapse in the next five minutes. <laughs>
You are part of God's eternal purpose. He is not going to let his church go. But you see, the second part of the chapter says, how do you become a member of that church? And verse 10 is a very key verse. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit or the spirit of grace and, applica and supplication. So God moves first. He pours out his spirit of unmerited favor, grace, and his people respond to him in prayer. Now, what makes you a member of Zion City? They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So when the spirit of grace is poured out, there is repentance. There is uh, a, a mourning for the one who has been pierced. Now, did you notice those confusing little pronouns in that verse? They will look on me, that is God speaking, and they will mourn for him. That is as though there is someone who is not God. But of course that isn't the answer. The answer is that this is the doctrine of the Trinity. Here is God the Father speaking, looking on me, the one they've pierced. Jesus, of course, is God in human form and the human body of Jesus was pierced on the cross. He was the one, the him, for whom they mourn. But because he is God, God the Father can say they pierced me. Now Jesus we recognize as the firstborn son of God the Father, the only begotten son of the Father, and he's the one who in his incarnation reveals to us the hidden nature of God and also bears our sins in his own body on that cross. So John's Gospel, chapter 19 and verse 37, quotes and applies this verse to that incident at the end of the crucifixion when the Roman soldier takes his spear and plunges it into the side of Jesus and blood and water flow from him, confirming his death. This is the piercing that's being talked about here. And we have New Testament authority for that, John 19.37. God identifies his son and himself as one, and it is through that dying of Jesus on the cross that our hearts are brought to repentance and our spirits to mourning for our sin and grieving over what our human rebellion did to the Son of God when he gave himself up for us all. And you see the extent of that weeping is in verse 11. The day uh, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great like the weeping of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. That refers to the death of the good king Josiah who was killed in battle on the plain of Megiddo and it's said in the Old Testament that the weeping extended throughout the land. It was so deep and so long lasting, mourning for the great king who had died in battle. But here is a much greater mourning for a much greater king. The mourning of the human heart in repentance that Jesus, because of my sin, went to that cross and he was pierced for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. So that's how you become a member of the New Jerusalem. Mourning for your sin, repenting of your rebellion, turning to the Christ who died in your place, experiencing the piercing of the Lord for you. But the second great thing is in chapter 13 verse 1 because on that day a fountain will be opened, says Zechariah. A fountain open to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Now this is the great second thing which members of the heavenly Jerusalem know and love. A fountain, you see, um, suggests an overflowing, abundant provision for cleansing and for forgiveness. That's what it says here, to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Now, of course, the uh, people of Zechariah's day and we as Old Testament Bible readers are very familiar with the idea of sacrifices for sin and the fact that in the Old Testament, sins could be covered over and forgiveness could be pronounced because of the sacrificial sacrifice 
death of a lamb or a bull or a goat in the place of the sinner. The great day of atonement is called in Hebrew Yom Kippur, which means the day of covering. On that day, the sins of the nation were covered by the provision of God who allowed the high priest to go into the holiest place of all with the blood of sacrifice to make atonement for the sins of the people on that one day. Their sins were covered. But that was just a shadow of what was to come. It's one thing to cover sins and that enabled them to live in relationship with God but it's another thing to cleanse them away and to remove the impurity. And that could only be done when the fountain for sin and uncleanness was opened as Jesus died upon that cross, the lamb who was without blemish or spot. I love hymns. I was brought up memorizing many hymns and they've stood by me all my life and uh, they often come to my mind. I'm very thankful to God for the hymns that are stored in my memory that are good biblical hymns. So when you're memorizing things, that is Christian songs, memorize songs that are worth learning. <laughs> Don't memorize the, I sort of think I kind of want to praise you Lord songs. <laughs> memorize the songs that contain biblical truth. Here's one. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there can I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Isn't that wonderful? That's what the fountain's for. It's the fountain of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Now, when we are cleansed by that fountain, look at the consequence, verse 2. On that day I will banish the names of the idols from the land, and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. So when I come to Jesus and I am cleansed by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross and there's no other cleansing, there are two consequences. No more idolatry. No more idol shrines in my life. No more secret places where I go to worship me by gratifying myself contrary to God's commands. No more rivals to God in my life where I put them first rather than Jesus. That is a continual battle. None of us gets that fully resolved this side of heaven, but we are set free to fight. And we need to fight the good fight of the faith. You see, there is a great enemy, the devil, and he will do everything he can to pull us down. He has two great weapons. One is the world and one is the flesh. And he will use the world, that's the external temptations all around us in a hostile culture. And he will use the flesh, that's our sinful nature that just wants to indulge itself and do what I want to do. And gratify myself and please myself. He'll use the world externally, the flesh internally, to try to destroy God's work in us. So that's why you can't compromise with idols. They have to be removed. If you're going to be in the heavenly Jerusalem, there'll be no idolatry. So let's get rid of the idols here in this world and ask Jesus in his great grace and strength to help us to overcome all the false alternatives to Jesus in the number one spot in our lives. Because idols only enslave you and ultimately idols destroy you. If you've been cleansed in the fountain of Calvary, no more idols. And the other thing is no more false prophets. See that in the verses that follow. I will remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land, says God, and if anyone still prophesies, they must die. The false prophets were a huge problem. They still are, in many religious contexts, all sorts of false prophets around who say things that come into their minds, who are wanting to get people to follow them. Many of them make a very good living out of it in terms of finance. But you are not going to listen to false prophets if you are a member of Zion City. So those are the two big changes that will happen. When you look on the one who was pierced and you repent of your sins, when you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, that is shed for sin and uncleanness, then the idols go and the false prophets go.
and we are only seeking to worship Christ and to hear his word of truth and to build our lives on that. So those are the first two things that happen. Now, the third thing occurs in chapter 13 at verse 7, and in many ways this is the summary of it all. So let's read from verse 7 to verse 9. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, God is speaking, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Here then is the third of the, of the pictures. These are the words of the Lord Almighty, as his sword is unsheathed against his shepherd. Now we know from last night that the shepherd is the Messiah who comes to pasture his people, to guide his flock, and they reject him. But what he is going to accomplish is achieved through the sword that is unsheathed against him. And of course, all the New Testament inferences come flooding in here. This is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The one, God says, who is close to me, literally in the Hebrew, my fellow. Which indicates that he is of the same divine nature, although he is in human form. This is God, the shepherd, coming to shepherd his people personally. The command, strike the shepherd, points out that it was really the Lord's will to crush him, as Isaiah says in chapter 53. It was God's plan to make him suffer, to make his life a guilt offering. That is not that God was a vindictive father crucifying an innocent son who had no say in it, but that the father and the son together brought the plan of salvation to fruition. The son lovingly fulfilled everything the father called him to do. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, he said. I always do the things that please the father. And so Jesus gave his life freely because he and the father had determined that through that death his people would be rescued. But it is God who is doing that. When Peter preached the first Christian sermon, he said in Acts 2.23, By God's set purpose and foreknowledge, Jesus was delivered up to death. And when the shepherd was struck, the sheep were scattered. Of course, that happened literally in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus was arrested, the disciples all forsook him and fled. Now that is the obviously explained and authorised meaning of this prophecy. Again, the New Testament is very specific. If you want to look it up when you get home, Matthew 26, verse 31, takes this verse and applies it directly to Jesus, Matthew 26, 31. But the smiting of the shepherd has a huge repercussion. It divides the nation, you see. Two-thirds, or the large majority of the people, are cut off. They reject him. They don't want him. They reject God's offer of eternal life. But the remaining third, whom Isaiah and uh, to an extent Zechariah would call the remnant, they will continue, although they will pass through the fire of trials and of afflictions. So there is a third of the people who recognize in the shepherd's sacrifice the hand of God at work for their redemption. And they, as they turn to God, experience the refining fire of God in verse 9, like the silver being purged of its dross, or the gold being purified. So we shouldn't be surprised when, as God's people, trusting in him, we do sometimes run into trials and difficulties, suffering and pressures. They're not arbitrary things. In a sense, we suffer the same hostility which was directed against our shepherd. But the trials refine us and purify us and deepen our relationship with the Lord and assure us of the unbreakable covenant love that he has towards us, which uh, he has initiated through his death on the cross and which he will sustain forever. So they're marvellous certainties at the end of verse 9, aren't they? They will say, 
sorry, he will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. That's a great fulfillment of the Old Testament. I will be their people, they will be, I will be their God, they will be my people. So what we're seeing here is that Zechariah is saying, although the shepherd is struck down, it is through that that the flock originally scattered is gathered together and though they go through many trials and tribulations and difficulties God's hand is upon it all he's refining their faith he's developing them as his special people now let's come to the last chapter 14 where God unites his fractured creation under his own sovereign rule chapter 14 brings us to the eternal kingdom to the end of the story verse 1 is literally a day of the Lord is coming or a day is coming for the Lord the emphasis is on the Lord it's his special day but it begins with what looks like an ominous message the city again is going to be attacked it will gather or I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it the city will be captured the houses ransacked the women raped, half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Now, you could say uh, that that might be fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans attacked Jerusalem, and uh, certainly there was great devastation along the lines of these verses. But I don't think that is the fulfillment because of verse 3. See, verse 3 says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. Well, that didn't happen in 70 AD. The judgment that came upon Israel because they'd rejected their Messiah meant that God did not fight for them, but the Romans fought against them, and they were scattered for 1,900 years. So verse 3 can't be referring to that. It must be that, again, Jerusalem is talking more about the eternal city, about the heavenly community about the covenant of uh, believers who trust in the Lord Jesus and if you look at church history these things have happened all the way through it doesn't mean that there has to be just one climactic fulfillment though that may happen at the end but that these are the things that have happened all the way through the Christian history there have always been enemies against the gospel um, if you use the imagery of a city, it's often been ransacked and uh, its people have been persecuted. So, just as there was never a time when all the nations fought against Jerusalem, so there has never been a time when God, as it were, went out and destroyed those nations as yet. So I think this is a, a spiritual, ideological conflict which is designed once for all to destroy the people of God and dethrone the Lord Almighty. And that would seem to be what New Testament passages like Second Thessalonians, the man of lawlessness, the, um, the, the, the focusing of evil in the last days in a determined attempt by the devil to stamp out God and his people. But then Jesus comes. Look at verse 4. As the Lord goes out to fight for his people, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, and you will flee by my mountain valley, as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Isaiah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Now this is apocalyptic language, it's symbolic. The idea is of God touching down on the Mount of Olives. That's a very appropriate place because that's where Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives. Now he returns to the same place and uh, he's coming back to liberate his people, to set his people free, to make a way of escape from this uh, hostility, this universal attack against him and his church. And they will flee when Jesus returns, he will make the way of escape for them and all the holy ones will be with him. 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about Christ coming again in power and glory, uh, that he will come bringing his people with him. He'll bring the saints who are already in his presence in the heavenly kingdom and those who are still on earth will be caught up to meet them in the air with the Lord 
And so says Paul, we will be with the Lord forever. So this all fits in with that. Jesus returns. His people are delivered from the great conflicts of earth. They are united with those who have gone before them in heaven. And the, uh, the heavenly kingdom begins. The eternal kingdom comes to fruition at his return. But verse 9, I think, is the point, the key pivot to it all. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. And on that day there will be one Lord and his name the only name. You see, what is going to happen at the end is that the Lord will rule in sovereignty over everything. One Lord, one holy name, all his enemies put beneath his feet. He will be the wall of fire around his people. He will be the glory in the midst of his people. And the other side of that great victory which his people will experience when Jesus comes and reigns over everything is that his enemies will be destroyed. And that's what you get in the next few verses. Uh, for example, verse 12, a plague which will strike all the nations, a judgment that will destroy those who are attacking him and his people. And that is a picture of the last judgment that will come when all his enemies are defeated. And now we see how the world will be unified under its sovereign ruler. Believing Gentiles and believing Jewish people, recognizing his awesome rule that he is the king, that he is the Lord, and they are the survivors of verse, six, uh, verse 16, who come to worship the king, the Lord Almighty, and in Old Testament term, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They come, as it were, to... Um, worship God, the Feast of Tabernacles is representative of their devotion to him, of their uh, setting him apart as their God, their Lord. And here is the fulfillment motif of the everlasting kingdom. Those who will not bow the knee to him experience his judgment, that's verses 17 to 19. But the book ends with an amazing picture of what the heavenly city will be like. Look at verse 20. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty. And all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them. And on that day, there will no longer be an alien, a Canaanite, in the house of the Lord Almighty. Now, to us, that's a very strange way for the book to end. Is that really the climax? <laughs> yes, it is. Because, you see, it's all Old Testament picture. The, the cooking pots in the house, the bells on the horses. They're not the images that we would naturally run to, but they're Zechariah's own day images. And what he's saying is, in the New Jerusalem, there won't be some holy vessels in front of the altar. Everything will be holy. Everything will belong to God. Everything will be set apart for his exclusive use. There'll be no more idolatry. There'll be no more aliens. That, uh, there'll be no more Canaanites. That's not some um, uh, racist comment. It's simply saying that there'll be no one in that city who is outside the covenant relationship that God has made with his own. That is where it's going. And when people say the last judgment is such a terrifying thing, of course it is because of the reality of being separated from God. But it is a very necessary thing. Because how can that eternal city be guaranteed in its purity and holiness and righteousness, which is the source of all joy and love and peace? How can that be guaranteed unless all evil is destroyed? Unless God is totally triumphant? over every hostile power. That's where it's all going, says Zechariah. That's the reality of the new creation, which we see, of course, so much more clearly in the New Testament. That's where we are moving. That is the now sense of fulfillment, as we see the future not yet fulfillment, and begin to say, then I must live in the light of that reality. The shepherd has been struck. The fountain is opened. The pierced one does bring forgiveness through his death on the cross. And every individual Christian has been cleansed and dedicated to God as the redeemed possession of the Lord through the death of the shepherd, through the precious blood of Jesus.
Now it is that cleansed and sanctified church of which we are a part through faith, which is going to be presented before the Lord as holy in every part. As Paul says in Ephesians 5, a glorious church, a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. That is where we're going. And all the potential for that to develop more and more within us is there in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in his sacrifice, in his resurrection, in his gift of the Spirit, to change us more and more into his likeness. So Zechariah at the end of the Old Testament points and focuses our, our attention on the new Jerusalem which is revealed at the end of the New Testament. And all that he prophesies points initially to Christ's first coming and then beyond that to his second coming for which we are waiting and longing even now. And so I want to close by reading you some verses from the last two chapters of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. Here is the third peak, the eternal kingdom, that Zechariah saw remarkably clearly in his day and which we are waiting for to see with our own eyes. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea, no separation that is. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. And then in chapter 22, as he sees more of this holy city, where everything is holy to the Lord, no longer will there be any curse, verse 3. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, they won't need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign for ever and ever. Behold, I am coming soon. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. See, God's pledged his word, his promises, are absolutely secure. Everything will be fulfilled. This future of the eternal kingdom is far more certain than tomorrow's dawn. Far more certain. So let's praise him for the great work that he's done, what our mighty shepherd king has accomplished for us. Let's thank him that he gave these wonderful visions to Zechariah hundreds of years before all this happened in time and that he gave us this vision ahead of what we will one day experience in the everlasting kingdom when we see him face to face and are really like him. Let's pray. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Gracious Lord, we pray that you will give to us an increasing yearning and longing for your eternal kingdom which will shape our lives here in this world. We want to be servants who serve you here, people who are effective in our lives and witness. We want to be those who continually repent and mourn the sins that sent you to that cross. But we want to praise you for your great grace and mercy in doing that work of redemption for us. And we praise you, Lord, 
and thank you tonight for the fountain open for sin and uncleanness. Thank you that uh, you can remove the idols, you can remove the false prophets and the false teaching and the false ideas that grip our minds and hearts. Thank you that you were willing to be struck down so that we might be liberated and brought into a deep relationship with you. We are your people and you are our God. So thrill our hearts with what is yet to be and help us to live these days in the light of those sure and certain promises. Help us to build the temple in putting your kingdom first as we saw on those first evenings, living for you and for your concerns. And keep us running the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We ask it for your namesake, for our blessing, and that your kingdom might come. In Jesus' name, amen.